Hi, this is Beth Anderson. Welcome to Working with Faculty Using a Consulting Model. This um, presentation is based on a book called Flawless Consulting by Peter Block. Um, it's a guide to getting your expertise used. I, I learned about this when I went for my master's degree in instructional design, and it has stuck with me um, all these years. <laughs> and um, I wanted to present some of the um, information that I found useful. So the first thing that is talked about is what is consulting? And um, the dictionary defines consulting as a business of giving expert advice to other professionals. However, Peter Block in his Flawless Consulting book states, you are consulting anytime you are trying to change or improve a situation, but have no direct contact, no direct control over the implementation. And that kind of hit home to me with our role at um, NOVA Online with faculty. We don't have direct control. So um, this is just ideas to kind of reframe um, possibly how our role and um, as consultants uh, and working with faculty in that, in that manner. So it's the lack of direct control and authority that makes consulting, can make consulting difficult. And according to Peter Block, flawless consulting is creating leverage and impact when we do not have direct control. And that's what we want to have sometimes with faculty is that leverage and impact of what our expertise is. For me, flawless consulting doesn't mean being perfect, it means being real and authentic. So it's great when, oh, I did that too fast. It's great when we can work like the puzzle pieces there and come together, but sometimes it's more like rock'em suck'em robots, or it feels that way sometimes, that we all, that they have their side and we have our side and uh, we're not working together hand in hand, but we're trying to get our points across, they're trying to get their points across instead of discussing things. So, Skill types. Um, so what I wanted to say too is we don't have direct control or authority over faculty, so it helps to develop our consulting skills and create a framework. So what this does is create a framework and ideas around developing the relationship with faculty. Thinking in terms of our role as consultants is one idea to consider. So just to discuss different types of skills, there's technical skills. The faculty, um, the technical skills is our expertise and the faculty's expertise. And as stated, uh, Jennifer and Alex both stated this in our faculty course orientation, the faculty expertise is in, lies in the course content and in student needs and backgrounds. Faculty also have the expertise in classroom exercises, activities, resources, and technologies that may be translated to an online environment. Our role, instructional designers, the expertise lies in the teaching process, learning, learning theory format, structuring content, and learning approaches in an online environment. So those are the technical skills that we each bring to the table. Interpersonal skills are the ability to listen, to give support, to put ideas into words, to reasonably disagree, and in other words, maintain the relationship. So those are your interpersonal skills. Collaborative, um, I'm sorry, I wrote that wrong. It's consulting skills. That should be consulting skills, not collaborative skills. Consulting skills are a different set of skills. And they include running meetings, negotiating wants, identifying working with resistance, coping with mixed motivations, dealing with concerns and loss of control, dealing with the political climate, 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 um, and focusing on here and now choices and not taking things personally. So those are all skills as consultants, uh, consulting skills that would help maintain relationships with faculty and build those relationships. 
So the next thing I wanted to talk about are the benefits of consulting well. The benefits would be our expertise is better utilized. Our recommendations are more frequently implemented. Partnerships develop with faculty. Win-win situations in place of no-win situations. So creating those win-win relationships. We develop internal commitments and we get faculty support. We also increase the leverage we have with faculty and we establish more trusting long-term relationships with faculty. So those are some of the benefits of, develop, of consulting well. So Peter Block states in his book, there are five um, phases in consulting. First is your entry. That's when we have our initial meeting with faculty. We explore key ideas. One is the project ideas. Two, we identify strengths of the project. Three, we identify skills of those working on the project, who is good at what, and therefore who would work best at what. And, what and four, what are the faculty expectations for the project? And what are our expectations of the project? Um, the initial project assessment, it, it's basically your initial project assessment or front-end analysis. The second phase is diagnosis. Determine our own sense of what is needed, kind of the who, what, where, when, and how. Who is involved? what is needed to complete the project, and how long it'll take. Phase three is the, the decision to act. And this is the planning of the project, setting the goals, the action steps. Oftentimes, um, this is where resistance occurs, where we have differing needs, desires, expectations. Uh, for instance, Nova Online has constraints that faculty might not be aware of or understand, like for instance, our course copying process, and when we need to copy those courses and get them out before the semester starts. Also, there are um, proctored exams, and sometimes faculty aren't aware of those constraints that we have, or campus politics that come into play that we're not aware of. Phase four is the implementation, that's carrying out the plan, or building the course, developing the course. And then phase five is extension, recycle, or termination. And that's where we either can build on more projects um, or we do, we recycle, we go back and make corrections, or we, we're done, we're done, that, we're done that particular course, that particular subject. Um, some of the things in this book are a little different in our environment because we're not like external consultants. Um, these are just models of working with people and having different skills set. Con think of consulting skill sets like managing the project and things like that that um, we might not always think of when we're because we're instructional designers and we're thinking of developing the course. But since we are having, a, we're working with a different part of the organization that has a different ideas, different needs. Um, different desires, those consulting skills could benefit us in working on the interpersonal relationships with faculty and the campuses. So what we, uh, I, I'm sorry, I did that slide incorrectly. So uh, we wanna move beyond substance. There's much more to working with faculty than the substance of the project. The substance of the project is what's the course about? How is it designed? What the content is? The other piece of working with faculty are the feelings, the affective side. Um, this is an important side too, and it's a valuable source of data. What, some, what are some of the real issues and what are the possibilities of establishing a good relationship? Peter Block states that there should be an equal balance of attention to the substance of the project, the course itself, and the feelings about the interaction that's taking place with your team. Once you value the effective side of the relationship, the next is to increase your comfort level with putting it into words. So there's four elements of the 
effective side. That's responsibility. There should be a 50-50 balance of responsibility. So um, that we're in it together. The focus is we're in this together. When we're working with faculty, we want to get across that we are in this together. It's a 50-50 shared experience of the outcome is a 50-50, we're 50-50 responsible for the outcome and working together. So there's also the second element is feelings. To what extent can those working on the project own their own feelings? Is the faculty defensive or controlling? Um, are we defensive and controlling? Um, or, or is anyone not listening and open to communi communicating ideas, communicating um, needs, and paying attention to our own feelings as well as faculty? And then there's the, the third element is trust. Do faculty trust us? Do we trust them? Confidentiality. Um, do they trust us to keep things confidential that they feel is confidential political things? Do they trust us that they won't be put down? Do we trust that they won't put us down? Do they trust that we won't take over things? I know that had been a big issue in the past that faculty felt like we're taking over um, their courses. So um, that it's a shared thing. It's not our course, it's not their course, it's Nova's course. Um, and that we communicate that. So we alleviate fears, we find out, we assess, we find out what their fears are, what their concerns are, and we openly address them, we're authentic. We ask questions and discuss issues and put our own intention into words to alleviate the fears and to build the trust. Um, you know, for instance, just simply stating, I'm not here to take over the course. Um, you are the content expert. I'm here to work with you and give my expertise in the flow of the material and so on. Um, your own needs. So the fourth element are your own, our own needs. Um, it's easy to serve, kind of fall into, I guess many of us, I think, fall into a service mentality in which we're there to serve the faculty needs and appear that we don't, and we appear sometimes that we don't have any needs. However, we do have needs and the needs are important. For instance, we have a need for um, the course copy. There's a need for that. There has to be, we can't wait till the last minute because it backs things up on, on our end at, at the last minute. There's a need for proctored exams because of uh, constraints we have in online because we're doing this online and we have standards that we have to meet. And they need to be aware of that. Sometimes they're, I, know, I know working with faculty myself, they are not aware of the constraints we have and the process that we do and the checks that we have that they're so used to working in on uh, on face-to-face -face classes that they can make changes at the last minute. They can get it done at the last minute. They can get it done partway through the course, the end of it. But they can't do that with our courses. And we need to be upfront and tell them what the constraints are and what our needs are. Um, so um, the next area I wanted to talk about is um, consulting roles. And this is what really hit me. Um, it, I, I just like this because I kind of, it's a framework that I use when working with faculty. Um, so there's the expert role where we are the expert and the faculty play an inactive role. We make the decisions, we gather the information needed, we plan them and collaborations not required. Two-way communication is limited with the expert role. And sometimes faculty expect that. Um, so um, the problem with that is that we don't have all the information. There are often politics involved we're not aware of. There's people issues. There's um, fear of loss of control of the course and um, things like that. So if we are the expert, the faculty will feel left out. They're also less likely to be engaged with the course. And this will come across to the students. They will have they um, they also will not have ownership of the course for ongoing improvements. So the second role would be a pair of hands. 
and that's where the faculty take con where the faculty take control of the course and we play a passive role. So um, the faculty makes the plans. Collaboration is not required. Two-way communication is limited. Um, the problem with that is that we're dependent on faculty to come up with the solutions, and our expertise isn't used um, to the extent it should be. And faculty may have a limited understanding of instructional design, and um, they're more on a face-to-face -face, uh, level of engaging activities and not the engaging activities that are needed online. So the third type is a collaborative approach. When we have a collaborative role with faculty, we enter into a relationship where there is that 50-50% shared responsibility for the quality of the work and the outcome. Um, problem solving is a joint undertaking with the collaborative role. Equal attention is um, equal attention is made to both the technical issues and the human interactions in dealing with those technical issues of course development. So there's not just the technical side, there's also the human interaction side where we're building and maintaining that relationship and dealing with the concerns and fears and maintaining, um, again, maintaining that relationship. So the choice really depends on um, on individual differences, the project and personal preference. So um, when you have the joint effort, the collaborative approach, uh, which is ideal and which is stated in our, um, by Jennifer and Alex in our orientation with the faculty, that we do have a different expertise, but we are hand in hand in this. Um, however, some faculty, uh, may be an expert, and this is where I think we have to think things through of what role do we want to play with what faculty, because every project is different, our group of people are different. So sometimes the faculty are experts in, um, in developing online courses because they've done it before, and they come up with really good ideas and really good solutions and or third party vendors they know on like in and inside and out and they can take over the expert role in that. Um, sometimes we, we are a pair of hands and we just, you know, do the things that they, they find difficult doing, some of the technical things often. So I think in a collaborative role, you can switch depending on your people, but you're still looking out for the quality of the work, the instructional design piece that we bring to the table. You're, even if we give over that expertise to them because they, they're good at it, we still monitor it and make sure they're on the right page. Because some faculty are, they might not be trained in it, but they're just good at it. And other, other faculty are, are, are trained in it, but they may not be so good at it. Um, so uh, we just have to watch and give our um, solutions and um, other ideas. And sometimes it's how we present those. So if we come at it, from we're in this together, there's no one taking over, and all those things are stated, it's a, it's a much easier relationship to have. Um, oh, I forgot to put up my little things here. Um, so the expectations are um, to listen and assess, you wanna listen to the faculty and assess their needs. What are the faculty goals? Um, I think that's a, first thing to ask when we have our kickoff meeting, what do they want out of the project? What do they want out of the course? What are their, what is their take on the problems of the course, the strengths of the course? So find out where the people that you're working with are coming from. What is their knowledge? What's their knowledge of what we do? What's their knowledge of NOVA Online and how it works and how it functions and what the needs are? What, and the other thing to assess is what are the skills? What are the skills of the people, the faculty that we're working with? What are our skills? Um, if we have a particular expertise, we claim that and, and we can say we can do this. If our area of weakness is one, they might have that strength and we kind of go back and forth on who does what based on strengths and weaknesses and we help each other out and teach each other. 
And also, what are the obstacles? What are some of the political things? What are some of the technology things that are obstacles in, in what we want to accomplish? Uh, it's key to be authentic as possible, to say what you mean and mean what you say, um, and to put things out on the table that might be uncomfortable. Uh, and the third thing is to set mutual expectations. Set up win-win situations. Um, think out of the box. So faculty want it this way and it's never been done that way or it was done that way or there's a constraint, is try to think of how can we implement this um, without, with meeting our constraint? Is there another way? Talk to people, come up with, talk to other coworkers and come up with ideas that we could possibly do what they want without um, slighting our own needs. Um, and also when we talk to faculty, frame it in a way that speaks to the faculty needs. So once you assess what the faculty needs are and what's important to them, when we do something, if we speak in those terms, we get more buy-in. We speak to the issues that will help them or help the students. So um, most faculty are very dedicated to their students. So if we point out that this would impact the students in a positive way, they'll there'll be more buy-in and be more engaged. And if they know that we're going to include them and we're going to keep them in the loop, they'll be more engaged throughout the process, even when it ended. They'll continue because our courses are a continual process of quality improvement. So we want to keep improving and we need that feedback. We need that feedback from students. We need that feedback from faculty. And we need that, we need to keep those doors open of communication in order to keep our courses um, the best they can possibly be. And thank you. And that is it for my presentation. I went two minutes over, but any questions? Well, this is Kim. I don't have questions, but um, I wanted to say uh, thank you for the presentation and for a good reminder. Uh, I've, I've got two takeaways. One is don't forget what my needs are as the instructional designer. I'm so worried always about deferring to faculty that I kind of do sort of forget um, to sort of maybe think about my needs, you know, as the ID uh, in a certain kind of way. So that was kind of an interesting uh, take. Um, so that was one takeaway I had. And the other takeaway I had was just um, uh, a nice review for like uh, assessing, uh, like thinking about roles and thinking about what you want certain faculty to do, um, maybe ahead of time and assess that ahead of time uh, before you kind of assign things in the meeting. So thanks for those two things, Beth. And for all of it, I'm going to check out the book. Okay, thanks. Uh, and I think really that good. I thought it was, this is Jules. Uh, I thought this is I'm Alex. Um, I thought it was really good. Um, I like the part about talking about the strengths because I think you know, with us working with HIM 130, it's really good to have a person who who is more linear, who can who handles the the processes of you know, like the learning objectives and those type of things. I mean, I I can do it, but I'm not. It, it's better to have someone who who more detail oriented and I can focus on the technology part of it. So that's been really good. But I mean, I think it's really, also I like the piece about being authentic and, and, and having to, to deal with things that are uncomfortable but putting them out on the table. I think it's a really, that's a really good way of, of, of addressing it. I think Alex does an amazing job of putting things out on the table that are uncomfortable and, and doing it in a, and saying it in a way in which you don't feel defensive. And I would love to be able to, to learn how to do that more. Yeah, I, I ditto that. I think he does a great job and I watch how he does it so I can learn how to do it better myself. And uh, Kim, too, what you were saying about the, um, I, I think I, I have found in the years of working with Nova Online is that sometimes it seems like faculty are more important and that it we hesitate to say what our internal needs are. And I think it's important to let, to let faculty know that, that we do have those needs and they are important um, in the process so that things run smoothly for everyone. And most faculty that I have found that I've talked about those needs, they're fine once they realize, you know, they get it, they don't, they, they wanna, um, 
work together. That's what I found when I put it out there. But um, I too have to remember that we have needs and, and it's important to um, to claim those and, and they're just as important as the other's needs. So anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Matt. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. And I guess Kim will, unless anyone has qu other questions, we'll kick off to you. Awesome. Great timing. Mm -hmm. Very good. I, um, you know, and, uh, have my headset connected, but I don't think I'm talking through it. Can you guys hear me okay? Is the sound okay? Yeah, it sounds fine. Okay, good. I'll just hang with it then. Jules, I should go ahead and load my slides up then, right? Yep. <laughs> it's, it's, here. It's, Sorry. Oh, you did it? I was wondering if you were going to do it. Oh, you want me to do it? I can't. No, I, you don't have to. I can do it. I can share. I'm sorry. I just didn't know. Yeah, I'm going to post them, though. And Beth, if you can send me your slides, that'd be great. Yeah, let me make a correction on that. Okay. So, oh, gosh, dang it. Of 2019. There it is. Let me see if I can get my presentation mode up. Awesome. Is everybody uh, with me and seeing just my title screen? Yes. All righty. And you can hear me all right? Because I'm going to yep. probably get rolling then. If we are ready, then I shall begin. First, I'd like to thank you for indulging me and giving me the time to practice some of this because this is part of my presentation for the Open Ed Conference. Uh, which is next week, if you can believe it, coming at the, uh, well, week after next. No, next week. All right, so this is uh, Community College Students Deep Learning Approaches and OER Courses, and uh, I did um, create it specifically for Development Fridays with the focus on instructional design, and I would also like to draw attention to the fact that I have openly licensed my presentation. I'd like to start role modeling that uh, behavior um, for those who are interested in sharing their work a little bit beyond Development Fridays at some point, you might want to openly license and then uh, you can determine how others will use your work uh, outside of our institution, if that's something that you are interested in pursuing. For today's presentation, here's a quick overview. I will give you the problem statement in a slide. I'll talk about the purpose in a slide, show you the research questions. There are only two that drove this study. Um, do a brief overview of the theoretical foundation and lit review, since that's not really the focus of, all, um, of, of our needs, but I will provide that for you in a slide each, and I'll talk about the methodology, but then we'll really spend most of the time talking about findings and implications for instructional design. And one thing I'd like to point out is I made a word cloud out of my dissertation, and I was so happy to see that this is what came out. So OER is front and center in the middle, but it's like a sandwich between students and learning because uh, that was uh, my hope. I didn't know if that's what I would find. Uh, that was my instinct. So as far as the problem statement knows, um, the research around open educational resources um, has pretty much well established that OER or open educational resources do uh, increase student access and uh, do make college learning more affordable for students. Uh, but my question is, do we know about OER and student learning? Uh, what impacts does OER use have on student learning? Some might argue that we do have some quantitative studies that show this, um, but I would argue uh, that we have no qualitative studies, which go a little deeper than quantitative studies and are a little different. Um, so I'd like to say that, you know, before my dissertation, I don't think there was any qualitative research that examined the ways students um, approach their learning when they use OER. So the 
purpose of the study then was simply to describe student experiences using OER and community college OER courses and to investigate the ways in which OER our use might foster approaches to deep learning in the same students. I know what you're saying. Time out. What's OER? What do you mean deep approach to learning? What are OER courses? Let me just give a few uh, definitions as a review. OER refer, refer to those open educational resources and that can be anything from one small object even a curriculum map that we are using, um, course maps as we call them, um, but, but any of that stuff that is freely accessible and licensed for use, reuse, revision, re, uh, remixing is, um, um, my thing just told me my internet is unstable, um, but that, those are OER. The five R's, those five R's are revise, remix, reuse, redistribute, and now they've added retain. Deep approach to, learn, to learning, um, learners concentrate more on the meaning of what they're learning. They're, they're interested in learning for learning's sake. They strive to find connections between their previous experiences or general knowledge and the topic being learned. Um, and this is a contrast to surface learning where students tend to just kind of memorize or just stick to the syllabus and don't go outside of anything that's in the syllabus. And I like the example of a student who, when provided with a, a, a diagram, busily copies it down, but doesn't listen to what it's for or what it means. And so the emphasis then is on the sign instead of the significance. So I thought it was important to just sort of examine quickly what I mean by deep approaches to learning. In this study, OER courses were traditional for credit community college courses students paid tuition to be in and in which the traditional commercial publisher materials had been placed in part fully by OER. You'll also hear me talk about open learning or open education and that's sort of a, a theory or an approach that just seeks to remove all barriers to learning and um, an open pedagogy which is an important term as well to student-centered practice it's high impact and this is where we're, we start to see a shift where students become more active participants, not just the empty vessel being filled. They contribute to the information. They don't just take it in, but they might create some new information. And, um, and the goal is to make the learning relevant and maybe to even create um, objects that are, have value in and of themselves outside of that classroom. So that's the aspirational open pedagogy. The research questions that drove this study were how do community college students enrolled in OER courses use OER materials? And how do community college students' descriptions of their use of OER materials reflect deep approaches to learning? Now, in order to do that, I had to think about some of the theory that was already there. I had to think about some concepts. And just a quick overview. So, you know, there is a KU framework um, that has been well established, used to examine OER and to research OER and, and those strands focus on cost, use, perception, or outcomes. Now in this study I'm going to focus purely on cost or on use, but as you'll see cost sometimes comes into play. You can't sort of avoid it when you talk about OER. The deep approaches to learning um, include um, some of those characteristics that I told you about. In general, seeking meaning for oneself is the goal of a deep approach to learning. Um, and then the open pedagogy that I've mentioned before. In open pedagogical practices, learners may self-organize, you know, make their own groups, assign their own roles, uh, figure out what the teacher's asking for in more detail or put their spin on that. And then they may innovate, you know, in their, in their solving of that problem. They look outside, you know, in, in open pedagogical practices, students will tend to sort of look outside um, to get validation for their own points of view or to like sort of check their teacher's point of view. And you see the, the power shifts in, a, in an open pedagogical approach because faculty sort of turn more into guides on the side instead of the, the sage on the stage. Just a, a real quick overview of literature around OER about um, the literature around OER and cost. OER save students money and provide greater access. Um, and there are more studies, but that, you know, I put in the third column some of the seminal or perhaps, you know, um, most cited studies to, um, to show that. Um, OER use in teaching, here's something that's very interesting and will not come to a shock to anyone in this room. Teachers use OER much the same ways they've used traditional 
materials. And now, although noteworthy exceptions exist in general, that's the fact. And um, with student learning outcomes in OER, it has been established that students usually do the same or better when using OER. There again are a one or two exceptions to that in the research, uh, but usually there's no significant difference uh, between students using OER and using uh, traditional textbook publisher materials. At the time of the study, there was no qualitative research examining student OER use <clears throat> and its impact on learning from the student's perspective. You know, that's key to me. We have a lot of research from faculty and researcher perspective, but we don't have a lot from students. We aren't talking to students about this as much. We're drawing our conclusions based on our interactions with students in the classrooms. And then the cognitively responsive perspective on student success needed to be brought up because that's the lens through which I sort of did this study and tried to make sense of individual student processes. Um, so. It was a qualitative research design, which means that I did a lot of talking to students and then you read through all of that material to uh, try to find patterns or themes that might emerge, you know, things that, that stick out to you. Uh, it's quite a lengthy process. Um, of those students I talked to in focus groups, those are, you know, small discussion groups, basically. I had some faculty at NOVA allow me in their classrooms, and this was important because we needed to know that students were in an OER course because I needed to know that students did have some experience using OER. And of course, one of the interesting things is students often uh, claimed they didn't know what OER was until I started to tell them what OER was, and then they completely understood. And uh, they were ironically enrolled in OER courses, and some of them or many of them didn't really like know what that was or what that meant. So, I mean, that's an implication for other people, not IDs, but, but that's an issue. I talked to about 93 students in 11 different groups, and um, we didn't count them and things like that, but, um, uh, but sometimes I could do some counting in the, in the data that I read through. And 35 students identified as first or second semester, but at the same time, there were other students who are obviously not first or second semester. Um, there were um, students from, as you can see, various uh, countries represented. So we have a large population of international students. It made sense they'd be in these groups. Um, so that, that was just in general. I just did these focus groups and I talked to these students at NOVA about their OER use. Um, what I did is I used deductive analysis and I used, a code, we call them codes, developed from deep approaches to learning and elements of the KU framework. And codes just mean like elements of or whatever. Um, for example, participants were asked to describe the process of studying, right? So that, that when they did that, they would expose deeper surface approaches and explain the ways in which OE, the use of OER, which is part of the KU framework, right? The use impacts their process of studying. And then in analyzing the responses, I looked for patterns that indicated like maybe they were syllabus bound or using unrelated memorizing. And if I thought they were doing that, then I, you know, they're doing surface approach to learning. But at the same time, I looked for patterns that indicated students were relating ideas to their own lives or trying to build on previous knowledge and thus deep approaches um, to learning then. Um, I would infer. So I made those sorts of inferences about their learning processes. And, um, you know, so if they describe studying as relating ideas, I inferred that they were using prior knowledge to help them grasp the new concept and that this was a, a deep learning approach. So, bum, ba, da, ba, my major findings. And uh, what I've done is I've distilled down pages and pages of data into two slides. So you've got uh, this nice Venn diagram where there's an intersection and definitely a correlation and a relationship among OER use, deep approaches to learning, and open pedagogical practices came into it. I couldn't help it. So for OER use, <clears throat> according to my research, students you know, do gain access um, uh, to, to these resources. And what they're doing is they're using it to fill in gaps, like to, to address weak areas or that they've self-diagnosed or um, to explore areas of interest outside of the classroom. And even though they were sometimes instructed um, by their faculty members to do this, a lot of times they did it on their own as a result of like really um, interesting and deep self-analysis over their learning preferences, accommodations, and needs. I found this pretty 
amazing. I think sometimes we don't give students very much credit, but the students I talk to seem very self-aware. For open pedagogical practices, um, I talked to students, they talked a lot about seeking out sources of information outside the classroom, not only to validate their own point of view, but really to check like their teacher's point of view and see what other people said compared to what their, their teacher said about certain topics. And they did this to form their own points of view. And so, you know, that is a, a deep learning approach, um, but that is an open pedagogical practice. So I put it over here. Um, students are collaborating with other learners through access sites like Quizlet or through Google Docs. And social interaction, I found, was built into the learning. Now, as far as deep approaches to learning, one of the things that I kind of did was say, hey, the way OER are designed, um, students are using them as they're intended and therefore um, they're taking some deep approaches to learning because what I found is a lot of OER are sequential, um, some are interactive, some have adaptive features, um, and all of this contributes to students' motivation, um, and then that contributes to wanting to make meaning and having a deep approach to your learning. Um, courses designed with OER tend to be student-focused or student-centric. Instead of focusing on the content, faculty are focusing more on what they want their students to learn and thinking about their students and then seeking out the content or the OER. Um, and the important thing is assignments are often scaffolded and there's a lot of frequent feedback. Again, this is, uh, again, a motivating thing um, for students and contributes to their deep approaches to learning. Now, what I also wanted to say is I wanted to look at the intersection um, of open pedagogical practices and OER use. So I'm going to look at those little areas where uh, singular aspects intersect. And at the intersection of OPP and OER use, students contribute to meaningful projects, you know, something that's not just disposable, the instructor reads, and then that you get your grade and throw it out, but maybe they'll share it with the class. Maybe they'll share it with other classes who are taking that same course. Sometimes they'll go even beyond that outside of class and form networks. Um, and again, the social interaction piece is important there. Um, at the intersection of OPP and deep approaches to learning, um, the, the realization that learning happens in social contexts is part of the deal. And at the intersection of deep approaches and OER use, um, the scaffolded approaches are built into the design, you know, whether it's an app, an interactive tutorial, or an entire course. And that basically leads me to my major finding, and it really isn't anything new or groundbreaking, but basically it's that um, open, uh, the use of OER can lead students down um, open pedagogical practices. Um, it mo it's a motivating thing and it, it leads to deep approaches to learning and what that leads to is an attitude of lifelong learning. You know, that's my major um, finding. And a couple examples to share with you, if you haven't already seen these that were just really important, I thought. Um, first of all, as I said, students will personalize their own instruction and remediate weak skills areas. And this is Rosalind, I called her Rosalind in the study. And she was so interesting because she was in her 40s and she was embarrassed about her, her math skills. And so she was able to use Khan Academy to teach herself um, be, so that she wouldn't sort of have to embarrass herself in front of her kids who would lose their patience with her. You know, so, you know, that's one of the, you know, you personalize their own instruction. They can go their own pace. They can repeat it as many times as they like um, and that sort of thing. Another example, um, they'll use it to personalize their own inst um, instruction to look outside a class, like with honor students. So I just am kind of showing you from all the way from an ENF2 student, you know, fundamentals of English before you can even take the freshman comp all the way to an honors English student getting ready to graduate, OER has applications. You know, she's teaching herself Japanese on memorize.com outside of class. So happy she doesn't have to pay for anything to do that. This is just a quick kind of like logic statement, but in general, OER use and learning, since OER design is often informed by current learning theory and makes use of techniques such as scaffolding, chunking, being student-centered, and since the format of OER is often digital, which makes it portable and interactive, 
and sometimes scaffolded and that sort of thing, students use OER as they were designed and they benefit and they demonstrate deep learning. A couple more specific examples are the Anatomy and Physiology app, which is scaffolded, sequ sequenced, and interactive, as you can see. And this is a student voice. I mean, this is quote, quoting a student. What I did to kind of remediate, he said, and this is in an English 111 class. And he's talking about his work in an anatomy and physiology class. So you can see how those um, overlay the different systems and how that's a scaffolded, chunked, kind of sequential approach. And then another example here, the memorize.com. But notice how she says, um, it adjusts how many repeats. So it's adaptive, right? If you miss a word, you keep getting that word. And also the student was motivated by like the little pictures and the beams, etc. An emerging theme in the study then is that um, student becomes the teacher, that OER can not only empower faculty to sort of have creative control over their course and the way they present material, but it empowers students. And really, um, when you look at the research, you'll see uh, that really part of the goal maybe is to um, get students to be independent, and not need us anymore. That's what I've always told my students that I taught. So OER just contributes to that. And ironically enough, there was some mythology around that where IDs will be usurped by OER, right? Since OER will make it the learners totally independent, they won't need anyone anymore. Um, but uh, <laughs> But I think that's a myth. And uh, there were also articles about a holistic approach to, to OER and instructional design. But here are the big takeaways for our team today. And I know I only have about two more minutes until question and answer, but I might take three or four. But you know, if you, if, you know, my recommendation as the OER lead on our team um, is to become familiar with the current landscape of OERs, know some key repositories and referatories. And I'm not going to click it now just because the time is so short, but Helen's got a great LibGuide. Uh, Heather started it before she left, and it's got um, a nice list of repositories and referatories, as we call them, where some OER can be found. I would, I would encourage everyone to collaborate with Helen Moore, our librarian Moore. Um, um, it helps to bring reluctant faculty along sometimes. The librarian can help with copyright and licensing. And, you know, we can debate over what OER is and whether the licensing is important or not, but students have free access to subscription database stuff as well, and the librarian can help us with that. I would recommend that you practice finding, evaluating, remixing, revising, and openly licensing material. Um, I'd love to lead, lead a workshop on it for our team, either synchronous or asynchronous. But um, there's a real great, if you want to follow this link later, it's a, a Canvas course for IDs that takes you through the process of building an OER for an adult basic ed course. We can maybe even use that as a team together. Uh, a fourth recommendation is to collaborate with other institutions and broaden the scope of sharing. For example, this grant that I have applied for to open up the professional writing certificate at NOVA. Well, first we'll get these online courses all OER, but then the goal was to share that through our shared services distance learning, like every college in the VCCS could benefit from that program. And, you know, I would like to encourage everyone to think a little more about sharing out what we do uh, and, and we can license it as we want to get the word out there about who we are and also to contribute to the greater good. Um, I would recommend too that you become comfortable with modularization of information, which I know we're already ahead of the curve on this, but we have to be advocates as well as comfortable users. Um, and I, there's just really an interesting piece I wouldn't mind you looking at here if you have the time about uh, the way instructional design and information is kind of changing as a result of this OER movement. And then finally, become familiar with open pedagogy and open pedagogical concepts and approaches, which I think you are. Um, but I don't know whether we all have that language and if we've revisited it lately. Um, but here's a nice um, link with three short articles that gives you a nice idea. So these are my references and I thank you for your time.